Well, greetings everybody and uh, welcome to our Build Your AutoCAD IQ webinar. So my name is Boker Coco and I'm an Autodesk Technical Support Specialist here in our Lake Oswego office and I will be co-presenting with Zach Travis in this webinar. He is also in our Lake Oswego office. And then we have Naman Mysorewala, who is, will be moderating. He's out of Westchester, Cincinnati. He's one of our Autodesk expert elites. So you'll be answering questions. I'll be answering questions. And Zach will be answering questions some, sometime throughout this webinar. So everybody, first of all, welcome. We're glad to um, have you in attendance for another one of our webinars. And for those of you who have returned uh, from previous web webinars, you'll probably be familiar with some of these slides. And uh, we do need to take care of this housekeeping here. So um, if you're new to the webinars, uh, feel free to leave questions in that chat window. One of us will attempt to answer. We'll also try to do some live Q&A after the session. And uh, the session will be recorded. Uh, the links are available in the registration reminder. Uh, we can post it in the chat window if you need it. Uh, the post-webinar survey will have those links, as well as a follow-up email, which Victoria will be sending out, uh, letting you know that the data sets are available. Uh, and by the way, that's what those links are for, so that you can download the data set for the webinar, as well as the script that was used to um, demonstrate. In our Autodesk Help webinar series, we try to do these weekly. And on the left side of the screen, you can see the upcoming topics, our next one being working with data extraction in AutoCAD. Uh, I do want to preface that our webinars are tailored for AutoCAD LT and up. So everything that we present to you, unless otherwise noted, is going to be available for AutoCAD LT users. There is one exception here, unfortunately, and that would be next week's webinar. Uh, data extraction is different in AutoCAD than it is in AutoCAD LT. So uh, that will be for AutoCAD only, that particular webinar. And we'll make sure to point that out in the email reminder. But uh, if you're an AutoCAD LT user, I'd Still welcome you to join us. We'd love to see you here. Again, the webinars are available on YouTube. The links will be sent to you. Data sets will be made available. I'd also encourage you to check out our customer uh, care council or AutoCAD customer council where you can join the beta program. You don't necessarily need to join the beta program part of it, but you can there leave uh, feedback there for um, our product group. Uh, they, uh, they visit that uh, forum every day. They are there and uh, you can get some direct feedback as far as feature requests, uh, concerns you might have about the product or, or just say hello to the guys. They're all, they're a good team. So um, a good place to go, especially if you're, if you like being on the bleeding edge, checking out the new technology. Being in product support, we assist in maintaining the Autodesk Knowledge Network. You'll find lots of articles and troubleshooting, uh, as well as documents, as well as downloads available on the Autodesk Knowledge Network. Articles which are written by us, uh, in fact, a lot of them are written by the community, our expert elites, and there's good information there about updates, uh, troubleshooting, pretty much everything you need. If it's not there, we typically tend to write a new article to populate the AKN with that information. Here's a biggie, Autodesk Answer Day. Coming up next week, right during my webinar. <laughs> um, anyway, at, what's Auto, what is Autodesk Answer Day? Hey, if you haven't attended this, this is very cool. Okay, it's going to be October 27th. It's going to be 12 hours where members of Auto, uh, employees of Autodesk will be answering uh, your questions in the forum. Uh, it by Autodesk employees, I mean 
uh, team members from the product group, from product support, from customer care, customer loyalty, uh, all these representatives and developers and, and uh, technical specialists will be there to answer your questions and um, uh, make a great day out of it. it. It is a fun thing for us. It's also a very knowledgeable uh, experience for us as well with the type of feedback we get. So join us on that day. So this week, this week's agenda is going to be about reference files. I'm going to talk about the reference manager. And the reference manager, among other things, allows us to reference files such as AutoCAD drawings, DWF underlays, PDF underlays, and finally we're also going to talk a little bit about importing a PDF. Now before we get started, I do need to run a few polls and um, for those of you who have returned, you're used to this, um, so bear with us and please participate in the poll. It really does help us out. The first poll is going to be a question as to are you a new attendee or a new uh, existing attendee, I guess, existing or returning? There we go, that's better. <laughs> my mouth is not catching up with my brain today or vice versa. I don't know. But uh, hey, about 10% of you are here for the first time. Maybe a little bit more. It's changing as I speak. But uh, for the most part, we're glad to see you. Okay, we're glad you're here. We hope uh, we make this a good experience for us uh, so that you'll return just like the other 90% of you have. So just quickly throwing that up on the board and uh, let's see that. Alrighty, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that one because we do have a couple more here. And these are all valuable uh, and this is all valuable information for us. We started um, getting into a um, webinars about our vertical products, so we always like to know what application you're working with. In this case, AutoCAD, the AutoCAD LT, any of the verticals or other applications. By other, other that could be Revit products or it could be a third-party vendor. Um, and it looks like um, pretty close split this time around. Uh, you know, with the majority there are still going to be AutoCAD and AutoCAD LT users, but um, uh, for the most part, let's let you guys take a look at how that worked out. 33% AutoCAD, so about 53% on the AutoCAD and LT uh, package, and then 25% um, using the AEC product. So, very cool. Thank you for uh, taking care of that poll. And then we have two of them that are related to this webinar. So these are new. You've never seen these before if you've been here. <laughs> yes. yes, we like to um, throw you off, throw you for a loop. So this one, um, do you uh, regularly work with external references or XREFs as they are known in the industry? And it looks like about 70 plus percent are saying yes. About 12 percent are saying, what's next ref? Which, hey, that's good. That's why we're here. I'll go ahead and close that one as well. And let's share that so you can see those results. 69 percent yes, 20 percent no, and 11 percent, what the heck is it? What is it, Boker? All right, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Let's go ahead and do our last one because we know that 70% of you do work with them. So the question now is, what type of reference files do you work with? Drawing files, PDFs, EGN, DWFs, raster images, So that's quite the um, the DWG I was expecting a high number on. Uh, 
um, PDF yeah, and raster images. So the only thing we're really not going to cover in this webinar are DGN and raster images. Um, uh, it's just those are topics by themselves. So let's go ahead and close this poll. I'll share it real quick so you can get a brief idea. And then I'm going to go ahead and take that right away from you. There we go. I'm pretty rude about that. Let's go ahead and, yes, we're going to go ahead and talk about references. And um, just a little, just in case you don't know what, uh, what the heck reference means, I'm sure you all do, okay? This is more for me. I had to find out. <laughs> anyway, let's uh, go ahead and see how all this works. And in order to do that, I am going to go ahead and send this over to Zach, who will start our presentation. Hi, Zach. Hi, Volker. Thank you so much. And uh, let me get this rolling here. I'll just make this as large as I can on the screen, and we'll get rolling. So everybody should be able to see my screen by now, hopefully. Hopefully. Yay. Anyone? Anyone? Uh-oh. Now let's try it again. Uh, how about now? <laughs> That's what I wanted, yes, the Jeopardy music. Uh, hmm. It's funny. Yeah, we're still, we're still kind of waiting on that one, Zach. Well... It's funny, it says it's showing my screen. Um, odd. Well, this worked earlier. Let me. Uh, there we go. There we go. Did we get it to come in? Yes. All right, very good. Okay. So. Uh, what we'll do here, let's talk about external references for a moment. Uh, there was a percentage that said, hey, what's an XREP? And, and like Boker said, that's what we're here to present. That's what we're here to go over and hopefully give you some information and uh, some ways of using the product that maybe you haven't used before. Maybe you have used it before. Maybe you just haven't used it in the same way. Maybe there are some options you've never explored before because, hey, you know, time being what it is, you've had pressures and had to get things done and didn't have a chance to explore the interface as much as you'd like. That's what we're here for. Maybe go over a few things you might have missed. Uh, again, as I always like to say, it's not a replacement for training, but we just wanted to make sure we cover some of these features that um, may not get exposure and, and some that do for sure. I mean, we're going to go over the, the basics here. That's what this track is for, back to basics. So a lot of stuff that's uh, really uh, just that, very basic. So let's get into it. So an external reference is um, a way of having content from other files appear within the context or framework of your current file. So to demonstrate what that looks like, let's just get into it. Let's start. Um, let's get in and open up uh, a first floor drawing that we have here. And we'll zoom in a little bit. We'll take a look around just for a moment and see we've got rooms and looks like some washrooms there and uh, some dimensions all over the place. Okay, so basically a floor plan, you know, that's, that's what we're doing here. So uh, in this case, we're going to bring in the elements from a second floor drawing. Now, I'll do this. I'll open it up separately so we can see what that looks like. So now we have drawing tabs up here for first floor and for second floor, and we can work in them just fine uh, on their own. Uh, we can go back and forth, and we can see them independently, but wouldn't it be nice if we could see them together in the same drawing model window at the same time and work on the various things from each one independent, uh, independently, but at the same time in the same drawing session. So that's what XREFing is all about. So we're going to do that. Now, to to bring in an external reference, there are a few different ways to bring up the XREF Manager. Uh, I'll show you a couple ways here. So by default, you're going to be on the Home tab in most cases. The Insert tab is where all the magic for XREFs happens. So if you look on the Insert tab and you go over to the Reference Palette specifically, you will see 
that um, you've got a pull down here at the bottom. And then in the bottom right hand corner, if you hover over this guy, you see it says external references. And that is what brings up the external references palette. And that's what this is here. And as it is a palette, you can leave it open as you work. Uh, and you can still work. You can see the crosshairs there in model. And uh, so it's nothing you have to close. It used to be with the old XREF manager, you could come in and you could work on your XREFs, tweak them a little bit, and then you'd have to close the, the XREF manager to go back in and work on your drawing. You couldn't do both at the same time. So it's nice that it's now a palette. It's been that way for a little bit. You can still access the old XREF manager if you really are nostalgic for the old days when you had to do one or the other not both at the same time. So that's one way to get in uh, to the external references manager. Also want to point out that there is the menu bar, the old uh, legacy menu bar. You can still turn that on. And in the insert dialog, you've got various ways to insert different uh, external references. Or you can also hit external references here and bring back up that external references palette all the same. So uh, I don't know if anybody noticed there, as we went down the insert menu, there's there you can insert blocks, DWGs, DWIFs, DGNs, PDFs, raster images, all separate commands they are. Uh, for example, DGN underlay is DGN attach is the command. Uh, X attach is for DWGs. DWF attaches for DWFs, but what they've largely done now is on the insert reference uh, ribbon panel, you've got this one master attach button, and that just does the attach command. And with the attach command, you get a dialog to select the reference file you'd like to bring into your drawing. Now, here's a pull down for files of type. And when you pull it down, you see all the different file types that you can bring in as external references into your drawing. So I'm just going to go with DWG here because that's what I'm covering. Uh, there are some other ones in here, like you see DWIF and DGN, uh, PDF. Boker's going to cover some of these when I'm finished. But for now, we're just going to focus on DWGs. So we're in the first floor drawing, as you can see in the tab up here. I want to bring in, as an external reference, the second floor drawing. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to choose that. I'm going to open it up. Actually, now that I think about it, I'm going to cancel it out just real quick. We're going to take a look at the layers that exist in the first floor drawing. And you can see they're all prefaced with a 1 there, most of the layers. And that's it. That's the extent of the list as it exists right now. That'll change here in a moment. That's why I wanted to show you it just real quick there before we do that. So let's go back into the Reference Manager and insert that second floor DWG as an external reference here. Now there are some various options you can do when you're bringing a drawing in, when you're bringing any kind of file in for that matter. Um, I don't want it scaled, so I'm not going to tell it I want to scale, but you could scale it up or down as you do the insertion. If you know, for example, you want it to be twice as large as the original scale in the original XREF, you can do that. Uh, it doesn't affect the original file, it just affects the representation of the original file in your current drawing. Uh, reference type, attachment or overlay, We'll go over that in a little bit, so I'm going to skip that for right now. The insertion point, by default, is to, uh, after you hit OK here, it's going to prompt you, with, you know, to click a point in the drawing where you want the XREF to be inserted. In some cases, you know you want it to be inserted at a certain point, so you can just uncheck the box there and put in your coordinates where you want the thing to come in, and it'll do that. So let's just uh, leave it the default. Uh, we're not going to mess with the rotation for now, uh, nor the path type. Uh, the block units, it's telling you what it was originally created in, and in both drawings I'm working in inches as my units, so we're not going to change that right now. So let's go ahead and hit OK. And when we do that, you see at the bottom, it's asking us to specify an insertion point, because that's what it had for us to do. So, as you see, as I move the cursor around there, I can insert it. Now, since both second and first floor drawings were created and they're the same building, they have uh, some matching up points and I used the same origin in both just to make it easy to snap them together here. So I'm going to snap this right at the origin here for my insertion. And then we're done. So now you notice here in the external references palette, we no longer just have first floor showing. We also have second floor showing 
as well as external two and three, which were references into the second floor drawing. And we didn't look at that previously, but we'll take a look here in a few minutes on what that, uh, what you can do with those uh, extra references, pass-through references, if you will. So now that this is attached, let's close this. And I told you about layers a moment ago. Let's take a look at the Layer Property Manager now. And we can see that it is much lengthier list than it was last time we looked. And because now we've got all these other drawings, layers included, and we can control the appearance of those layers within the framework of our current drawing by using the Layers Property Manager here. So it's a convenient way to control the display within what we're looking at now. Now, you might have noticed the pop-up down here. It says, Unreconciled New Layers. What's that all about? What that is, is nothing more, nothing less than when you bring in a drawing or you bring in a block, for that matter, that has layers in it that didn't exist in your the drawing, the parent drawing, into which you're inserting the reference, it's going to say, hey, did you know, here come some new layers that you might see in your Layer Properties Manager. And that's all it is. Um, by default, it creates this unreconciled new layers filter to show you specifically which layers came in just now when I brought in the XREF. Now, in order to make this filter go away, um, what I like to do is just highlight all of these new layers, right-click them, and reconcile them. And that lets AutoCAD know that I know they're in there, so it'll stop bugging me about the unreconciled new layers. Now, since I didn't click the hyperlink down there, it left the balloon on the screen. But now you can see my unreconciled layers filter is all gone because I no longer have any unreconciled layers. Now, uh, if you came from a previous version and a much older version where we didn't have any of that, um, you might be saying, well, how can I turn this off? Uh, very easy. In Layer Properties Manager, you click your settings gear up here, and here's all about new layer notification. If you simply uncheck this top box, it won't tell you anything about it. Um, you, there are a couple of variables within here. You can um, uncheck the box to notify you, but it will still create the layer filter that indicates in the Layer Property Manager that you have unreconciled new layers. And you can see that when you come into the Layer Property Manager, but it won't give you the balloon if you uncheck that. So, But again, if you um, uncheck this top box here, that completely disables the whole concept of new layer notification, doesn't make the layer filter. Uh, it just It's just like legacy behavior, uh, like it always was prior to this. Uh, I can't remember, it was three or four or five releases ago that we started doing the new layer reconciliation concept. Uh, but that's how to disable it if you don't want to be prompted for it. So now that we've got this um, in here, um, Let's talk about, um, speaking of layers for that matter, um, the layers as they come in here, these colors for the XREF dependent layers are whatever the colors are in the original drawings. Now you can change the display in here for the purposes of the, you know, working in your current drawing. And that those those session or those states will be saved uh, with the current drawing. So when you open up first floor again, uh, all the references uh, layers that you might make changes to, uh, you'll still have those changes next time you come into first floor. So you, it's not a temporary thing. There's a setting you can tweak to to change that, but uh, by default it lets you keep things the way you want them, assuming you want them to 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 stay with your changes there that you make to the layer properties manager. So um, now we talked a little bit about, um, well, we looked at the insertion. When you do a, an insertion of a, of a, a new anything, um, you get options for things like overlay and attachment. And these external one, or sorry, external two and external three here, I'll show you what those guys are. What we'll do is we'll open up here. We'll open up the second floor drawing separately in its own session, so that when we look at the reference manager, we see external two and external three are references into this second floor drawing. Now, uh, the type here is attach. Now, what does attach 
versus overlay mean. So what we'll do is we'll demonstrate that here. So if we say make this one an overlay and this external two is an attach, let's save the changes then to this second floor drawing. Now anytime you make a change directly to a reference file, if you go back to first floor now, we'll have a pop-up here in the corner that lets us know that there's been a change made to the external reference file and it prompts us to reload it so that we can see what changes were made. So let's reload and you notice that external 3 disappeared. And if we look at the reference palette now from within first floor drawing, we only see the second floor and its external 2 reference. We no longer see the external 3 reference. The reason is that in second floor, external 3 is an overlay. And overlays don't pass through when you reference their parent drawing into another file. I know that's a little confusing. It's several layers of xref and xref and xref, and this is a real simple example that we're working with here. So you can imagine how that could get complicated in a hurry if you've got several xrefs into several xrefs, which is not uncommon at all. So uh, be aware of what overlay versus attach means, and that's uh, really all we wanted to cover on that. What I'll do now, I'll switch it back to being attach. And I'll save my change. I'll go back to first floor, and even in the XRef manager, it tells you, as well as the balloon pop-up, that you need to reload the second floor drawing because a change has been made to it. So let's do that. And now you see external 3 pop back in there because it is once again, been set to an attachment type instead of an overlay type. So let's close out up here. So let's go into a little bit more simple files, samples that I made for this. And I want to demonstrate a couple of other concepts. So let's go into a parent drawing file. Now in, in your various disciplines for building, you might have drawing layers that have the same name uh, and various objects within drawings that have the same name. So what happens when these come into conflict with each other? Because when you externally reference something, and let's do that here, uh, I'm going to open up first and show you what's in this other file here, this child drawing. Let's look at the layers that exist in both drawings. So this is, in the child drawing, I've got layers 1 through 5, you know, named layer 1 through 5, and I've got one that's called child only layer, and you can see what their colors are. You can also see that layer 0, which all drawings have, uh, in this case it's blue. If I go back to my parent drawing, I also have layer 1 through 5 named, but they're different colors than they are in the other one, and layer 0 in this case is white and not blue. So let's see what happens then when we XREF in the child drawing. Now initially we wouldn't expect any kind of fireworks because we're just going to uh, XREF it in. So let's do that. We'll choose the child and say OK to that. Now let's put it, we'll put it right next to this guy. OK. So there's the child listed there. It's loaded. Everything is good. Let's look at the layers property manager and see what we're dealing with now. So when you have an XREF, it tells you the name of the XREF and it shows you the name of the layer. In this case, there's no conflict. Everybody maintains their properties. All the ones from the child drawing maintain their colors, and all the ones from the parent drawing maintain their colors, as you can see there. Also, one thing I wanted to point out as well is that you notice this uh, XREF here looks a little faded out. Uh, well, a bit more than a little actually faded out. And that's by design. Uh, not too many revisions ago, we had a variable introduced that makes these fade out so that you can quickly identify what's an XREF and what's not an XREF. Uh, you can disable that, of course, just like anything else or most other things. And I'll show you how to do that here. In the pull down for the reference panel here, we've got this XREF fading concept, and that determines percentage of fading for your XREFs. Now, by default, it's 50%. If we increase that slider here and go up higher, 
it fades out even more. I don't know how the display is coming through on this webinar session, but um, it's pretty faint at this point. And we're up to 81%. I think it goes up to 90% is the top here. Now, if you slide it all the way down and get it to zero, you notice everything brightened up. That's because when you turn XREF fading to zero, it effectively disables XREF fading, and there isn't any XREF fading, so the content of your XREF appears just as brightly as it does within your parent drawing. So, where is this all going? What I want to show you is that you can, in this case, I've got two drawings, and if I wanted to send uh, somebody this parent drawing, I'd also have to send them the child drawing so that they could see everything just as I see it on my system. If you only want to send somebody one file, though, what you can do is there's the concept of binding your XREFs, and that brings all of the content that was formerly in another file and makes it defined directly within the parent file in this case. So let's see what happens when we do so. If you right-click the XREF, we have the option to bind. The bind then gives us two options. We can do bind or we can do insert. And if you hover over each, you'll get a tool tip that breaks down what happens when uh, you bind versus insert. Now bind, as it says here, um, any XREF dependent named objects like layers, for example, uh, will retain the original drawing's name and it gives you the syntax there, what it's going to look like. So it can be a little ugly, and let's see what that looks like. Let's bind this child drawing in here. So now there's no more XREF. All the colors remain the same. All that's good. Now if we go look at the Layers Properties Manager, all the layers that came in from the child drawing now have the nomenclature, the syntax that is showed in that tooltip there. So they all maintain their original colors. Uh, everything is maintained on its own separate layer, so there's no merging of the layers. Everybody maintains their own independent properties just as they had them before. So that's all well and good. Um, sometimes you get long file names, though, and as you can imagine, long file names bring long, longer layer names into the Layer Properties Manager. So you may find a, a drawing that's been bound, and this is a big mess in here. So let's undo the, the bind, though. So let's take a look back here at insert. So now we have back to where it's an, it's an XREF. We'll do the other option for binding now, and we'll choose insert, and we'll see what happens there. Okay, we're down to just one drawing again. Now you notice most of the layers from the XREF are now the same colors as the parent layer. So what happened there, and we'll take a look at the layer manager now, all the layers with the same names got merged. So a choice is made there as to what happens to their properties. Well, the parent drawing wins, and its properties for those same named layers take over and are then enforced on the objects from the same named layers from the XREF. Now, there's one here that maintained its color, number six on the right there, and the reason for that is because that child-only layer is just that. It's a layer name that only existed in the child drawing. So there wasn't one in the parent drawing to override it, and that's why it was allowed to keep its original properties. And the layer list also is much cleaner. Now, XREFs are not some magical creatures. They are, uh, by many accounts, objects just like any other. and what I mean here is that you can do things with them that you can do with many other objects, like, for example, you can select them, right-click them, and you can move them around. You can copy them. And you can make copies of them. You can mirror them. You can scale them. You can do just about anything with a few exceptions, that you can to any, any other object, and now that one's three times larger than its others. And if we look at the reference palette, we still only show one reference, even though there are several instances 
of the reference. Uh, we can rotate them. We can do just about anything, and of course we can erase them as well, but the preferred method of getting rid of uh, doing away with an XREF is to go in the XREF manager, right-click it, and detach it. Also, you can through that right-click menu, you can change things like attach and overlay, which we looked at. Pathing has to do with whether it's an absolute path, like for example, down here you see this whole path here. That's an absolute path. Um, this dot slash notation is an example of what a relative path looks like. And a relative path is handy if you have different drive letters but the same folder structure, uh, if that makes sense to you. Um, then the dot just goes back to the old DOS notation for changing directories and whatnot. But, so those are a few of the things you can do with uh, binding. And uh, hopefully we've covered here what, what happens to layers and objects within XREFs that have the same names if you choose to bind XREFs. So XREFs are a very, very powerful tool that allow you to to bring in a reference to other files, see them, work with them within the context of your current drawing, uh, while not necessarily making any changes in the original file. And if you do make changes in the original file, you can always update that representation within the current file. In fact, you're prompted to update the representation of that within the current drawing file. So that's a little introduction into what you can do with XREFs. So at this point, uh, to go a little deeper into it, I'm going to throw it back to Voker. He's going to cover different kinds of XREF files that you can attach and uh, the various things and neat new tricks that you can do with those. So uh, we'll throw it to Voker. And yes, I'm sure I want to change the presenter. Voker, are you still with us? I am, Zach. I am indeed. Now, um, very good. Thank you. That was that was great. So um, right now you're pricing my PowerPoint, which I didn't want showing right now. There we go. We want my AutoCAD showing. All right. Yeah, we have our moments here. Um, very good. Uh, so I'm going to be making this quick. Uh, we have a few topics to uh, um, address and. Um, don't worry about getting lost. The data set has my little spiel that I'm going to present, and uh, you can just walk right through that if, if you do get a little bit lost. So what I have here is an AutoCAD drawing, just a layout of one, and I'm going to begin by talking about DWF underlayers. Okay, This is a drawing web format uh, that Autodesk uh, um, implemented. I think it was AutoCAD 2004. Uh, don't quote me on that. But either way, in order to begin, I need to backtrack a little bit. I am going to create a DWF uh, as I would create maybe a PDF from an AutoCAD drawing. Uh, there's a purpose for this, uh, the reason I go, um, am going through this process. So I've already set up a page set up here uh, to print this out. And what I want to show you is DWF, and this applies to PDFs as well, have some custom properties that are not enabled by default. And I just went in here and I clicked custom properties, and then I need to click custom properties again. DWFs and PDFs are both a compressed raster format um, that we can change a, a DPI on to increase the resolution. I'm not going to modify any of these right now, but you should be aware they're here. But one of the uh, two of the things that um, uh, you should be aware of is that we can save layer information in both AutoCAD DWFs as well as PDF files. And uh, of course, we can save a preview in the DWF uh, as well. But these are both disabled. So if you want any of this, or maybe you don't want layer information included with your PDFs and DWFs, then make sure this is unchecked. Anyway, clicking OK here, I'm just going to go ahead and click Cancel, and um, I'm going to go ahead and just plot this because I, I'm confident that it is going to work as expected. 
All right. Now, saying that, I usually find myself in an awkward position. But I'm going to um, minimize this right now, and let's go ahead and take a look. We now have a DWF from that model um, uh, created here. When AutoCAD is installed, unless you choose otherwise, an application called Raster Design gets installed. Double-clicking on this will now launch that application. I'm not, this is not about raster design, okay? But um, raster design uh, is a great collaboration tool. It's a free application available for download if you don't have it installed. The link is going to be in the uh, PowerPoint slide that uh, uh, will be available uh, with the data set. Now, it's a great tool for markups, it um, uh, measuring, Keep in mind, if you measure something, um, it, again, it's a raster format. So depending on the resolution, uh, there's always going to be an approximation as to what that distance is. But it's uh, pretty close. You know, you can gauge if it's right or wrong. Uh, right now, I'm just going to add a couple of markups here. One, I'm going to put in a revision cloud. And uh, uh, actually, I'll go ahead and use the rectangular one. It'll be a little... Uh, faster, more, more better, and uh, hey, wh what the heck, why not put in a, a stamp here as well? So I'll do for review, okay, because I want, um, maybe I want some markups done on this particular file. It's been sent to me by the drafter. I'm going to send them back this file. So I'm going to go ahead and click Save, and I don't need raster design anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and click Close. And I am going back to AutoCAD. And what we have in AutoCAD is a tool called a markup manager, or a markup set manager. And this is actually found under the view pull down menu. And, or view pull down, <laughs> how old school is that? Um, under the view tab of the ribbon in the palettes panel. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and invoke that. Now, what I need to do, again, we're in the original drawing here. I'm going to go ahead and select Open, and then I am going to make sure I've got the right file here. I'm going to go ahead and select that. Now, not just going to give you a glossy overview about this because of the amount of time we have for this demo, but here is the uh, DWF file itself. And here is the um, layout that we created a, a DWIF from, and then we have the two markups. Now, I can select these markups individually by double-clicking on them, and they will appear in the drawing. I'm very lazy. I'm just going to double-click on DWF demo. Now, bear with it. It takes a minute to load the markup file, which is nothing but a uh, raster en entity and then it'll um, populate the drawing with that markup if I double clicked it. <laughs> All right. There we go. It popped up. So uh, at this stage here, I'm the drafter. Okay, hey, they want me to review this, make sure it's okay. It looks good to me. I'm just going to send it back. Um, I could add some additional um, comments to this. For example, the Rev, Rev Cloud here, I can go ahead and um, add some additional items to it. Um, I'll let you guys explore this part yourself. But uh, it's good technology. It's pretty cool, OK? In order to get rid of the markup, I would want to close the markup DWF. So that's one way. The markup itself is an underlay for uh, our AutoCAD drawing. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just go into a new drawing. And as Zach pointed out, the XREF manager, whoops, not explode manager, the XREF manager, okay, he's already gone through the glossy overview on this. So I'm just going to go ahead and select attach DWF here. And I'll select the um, uh, file that I just generated. And yeah, oh, that's just one of those awkward moments. 
I actually did have, have that happen earlier. I'm um, not sure why it started doing that all of a sudden, though. So um, I'll just ramble on. So what we're getting at here is that these um, DWFs, uh, how are they different from a PDF? Well, first of all, PDFs can be converted by other applications. With uh, the DWF, there's no conversion tools for those. They're probably the most, um, I'm sure somebody's cracked it, OK? but. The bottom line is that they're, uh, for the most part, they're very secure file formats which cannot be modified uh, by anybody you know, unless they want to mark it up using raster design. All right, so getting back to this, I think Zach just pointed out to me that I've been saying raster design. <laughs> I uh, Awkward. Um, it's actually called design review. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, awkward moment. For those of you who know me, um, you were probably expecting this. All right. So let's try this again. There we go. So it looks a lot like the attach and external reference uh, dialog. Uh, and, and it is, uh, but it's for a raster image. It doesn't have some of the functionality that um, uh, we have for external references. Uh, drawing references. I'm just going to click OK and zoom in on this. Now, as I select the DWIF, you'll see that the context ribbon changes. And we had saved layers in the DWIF. So if I select this, edit layers, and I could do that through a right click as well, I can actually turn off layers I don't need uh, so maybe I don't want to see the um, the title block, okay? So I've just turned that off. And this would allow me to um, get rid of the stuff I don't need, reference this file, because I can O-snap to it, okay? We have this enable snaps. In the past, this was disabled. It's called the U-O-snap system variable. It's a drafting uh, uh, um, tool. And it allows me to snap to raster objects in a drawing. So, for example, I want to do a distance. I'll go ahead and type DI. Let's zoom in on this a little bit. And I'll just snap here, and you'll see that we have this raster snap. And notice it says approximate. Okay, again, it all depends on the resolution. So this tells me it's 149.9917. I know that's small text down there. But um, basically, that also shows me that I need to scale this raster image. And using the scale command, I can do so. I'm going to forego that just because of time constraints. I probably all know how to scale an object. I hope so, anyway. Um, uh, but I'm going to move on now. Uh, um, I guess I want to point out real quick, and we'll get into this with the PDF as well. There are other options here. We can clip this just like a reference file. Uh, we can uh, change the fade factor and contrast. Oh, and we can also display just monochrome, which is a great little tool, actually, to distinguish this as a background compared to the rest of the drawing. OK, so that's my quick thought on that, all right? A uh, quick way to also to turn off the underlay is by clicking the Show Underlay button. So in case you want to see your finished line work that you mod you've modified. So moving on, I will go ahead and uh, close this particular drawing. Now we'll move on to a PDF. PDFs, when, um, when working with a PDF, very similar to working with a uh, with a uh, DWF. Sorry, tongue's very tied up right now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and select attach PDF. In this case, I'll go ahead and select this particular PDF and click open. And again, same thing, just like with the DWF attach dialog. Okay, we have all the same options. Again, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory after Zach's little demo there. Okay, 
Now, the D PDF does the same thing as uh, we have all the same options up here. Uh, the one difference is, is that we can, and actually we can measure, use all our distance tools, snap to this using that OSNAP variable, UOSNAP. But the difference that we have here is that we can actually import this using a, and this is available in AutoCAD 2017. If you're running earlier than that, uh, apologize, you aren't going to have that functionality, okay? But if we go ahead and uh, select the option here to import this PDF, actually that one brings up a dialog. And right now I'm forgetting where we find the command itself, so I'm just going to type in PDF import. And you'll notice, if you can see that on the command prompt, it says PDF import, select PDF underlay, or open up a file from the hard drive. Well, I'm just going to select the underlay I have. I have to select the frame. And then I'm just going to hit enter to tell it I want to select all the objects in this PDF and import them. I'm then prompted, do I want to detach or unload the PDF? I'm going to go ahead and say, look, I don't, I don't need it anymore after that, and I'll just type D for detach. And now it has converted this PDF, including the, our little title block here, and we have line work available here. And this is all, we can modify this. Uh, depending on what the objects are, it's going to bring it in as uh, uh, single line work, or excuse me, polyline work. If it's a text object, such as a true type font, then it would bring that in as a text object. The limitation here is that any text which is a shape compiled font is going to be treated, uh, it will not be converted, it will be treated as a uh, as line work. Okay, and you can see all the vertices here. Now, the way to get around this actually is to have true type fonts in the drawing, or when you're printing, you could actually open up the drawing with uh, by creating a font map uh, with the appropriate substitutions, which we don't have time to demonstrate here. Uh, font mapping. Look it up in the help though. It's pretty cool. All right. So like, let's take this one step further. I'm going to go ahead and uh, use the open command. Yes, because that allows me to open up other files. <laughs> and I will open up. Actually, do I need a new file? No. I actually wanted a new file. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Close this, and let's use the PDF import option from here. It has not been in the underlay. I'll select PDF import, and here's a different um, PDF. This is a multi-page PDF, and there are a total of four pages in here. So this allows me to choose what um, page I'd like to import. And I'll go ahead and select page three here. And I want to point this out right now. There's an options button here. This PDF contains images. And you can change the location of where those images will be stored. Because what it's going to do, it'll convert the image, keep it in the drawing, but it'll be treated as an image reference file. Okay? Now here you can define a path by browsing to it for a specific lo location. But if you don't do that, then by default, it's going to place an image folder in your current working folder, which is kind of cool, OK? Uh, and like I said, you can change that on the fly there. This options dialog, not all these options are uh, actually uh, selected. Uh, this is my last selection here. If you are working with raster images, that is unchecked by default uh, initially, all right? So I used it last time. It's checked now, so it's going to 
also bring in my raster images. Uh, I'm going to use PDF layer, so it'll create a PDF underscore layer. And then I'm, I also told it, hey, if there's any um, collinear line types, then create, or collinear dashes, then create the suitable um, dashed line type for that object. And of course, apply line weight. Go ahead and also import true type text. Having said all this, I'm selecting uh, page three. I'm going to click OK. And I actually blew it. I should have also set the scale factor for this to a scale of 48. Um, so that was my haste, my bad. But, you know, the visual here is going to be the same. All right, not going to change. Yeah. Um, if we take a look at this, well, first of all, let's take a look at this. It, uh, where is it? Desktop, on oh, my desktop. Yes, I want to go to my desktop. Yeah. Okay, I must have used a different folder. <laughs> Let's go right here. Sorry about that. I did use a different folder. And nope, didn't do it here. That's odd. Oh, that's right. My apologies. I'd already redirected my PDF folder and never reset it in options. Okay, so it's actually saving it to my support folder where I specified. Uh, yeah, another awkward moment. Um, for those who may want to return next week, you'll probably see me have more of these. So um, again, notice the um, uh, vertices for the shape compiled text. But note that here with the um, TrueType font, this is actually an mText object. So it's brought that in. Uh, blocks have been brought in, and there's my image file. And if we go into the XREF manager here, you'll see we actually have an external reference uh, being listed in uh, for that image. Let's go ahead and do the tree view so you can see that it is referenced there. Okay, so uh, cool stuff there. Let's take a look at something, though, that was added with 2017 Update 1. And this is really cool. Um, there are some new items on the import panel. One of those is Recognize SHX Text. And here are my recognition settings. So these are some of the fonts that um, have been added to this. As a default, we can add more shape-compiled fonts. You'll notice simplex here is selected, which is what this was down here. Um, I can change layer information for these objects, but to make this brief, because we've almost run out of time, I'm going to cancel out of this. I'm going to go ahead and select Recognize Shape Compiled Text. Let's zoom in on this so we can see this here. I'm going to go ahead and select, select this here. And I hit enter, and it tells me two of three groups of selected geometry was, geometry was converted to text. Let's see what was done. Okay, that was not for some reason. That was. So that was as well. I'm not sure why it didn't grab uh, do that one there. I'll have to play with that. This was an ad lib at the minute, last minute. I'm going to cut it short right now. Uh, the script is pretty, um, pretty um, self-explanatory. So, just briefly, we're going to run one last poll. There are some resources, though, here, and we're going a little over the hour. I apologize. Uh, check out these resources. We'll talk more about it in addition to the um, script. Let's do our last poll because, uh, and this is super important to us, this particular poll is to find out, hey, if you learned anything at all, and we realize that it was a little fast there at the end, but if you could uh, provide us this feedback, that would be wonderful. And so it looks like about, uh, we're getting right in the high 90s anyway, saying, yes, we learned something new. 
hey, this is only a glossy overview, okay? Um, uh, and that's all it was meant to be. We ran a little short at the end here, I apologize. Um, but for the most part, I hope you've seen something that you feel you can use in the future uh, in your everyday work. I'm just going to share this poll and um, let you see what's going on here. So, um, Zach, anything urgent there before we cut off? I know I've got some questions here. Probably. No, I, I'm good. I think we've managed to hit most of the high points on the questions in here. Uh, as Volker said, I skip some stuff and he skips some stuff, but it's in the scripts that are up there. So do check out the data sets, do check out the scripts because, uh, you know, there, there were plenty of things we always want to go over that we run out of time for. So sometimes we judiciously choose to skip things in our scripts. So that's why we put them up there. Yeah, feel free to follow up in uh, the email for the webinars, uh, but we are going to cut this off right now for Zach, Naman, and myself. Uh, we really appreciate you guys being here. We know your time is valuable. We hope to see you next week. Cheers. Adios.